So hey everyone, with me today I have Christian Anton from Secaden. Welcome, tell us a bit about yourself and your company, the company you work at. Thank you, um, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, we are a small consultancy company um, located in the south of Germany. Mm, not so small anymore to, uh, to be uh, concrete or to be <laughs> exact. Um, we are right now in the phase of uh, merging together four companies and creating something entirely new. And um, yeah, my, my part of this uh, is to um, keep up with the monitoring and uh, modern ways of managing IT infrastructure, managing and building IT infrastructure. And um, yeah, all from a purely consultancy point of view. So we help customers to build up, we consult them in, in how to do things correctly, um, really from, from, from the ground up or in, in existing infrastructures. Of course, always meet with a focus on, uh, as, we, uh, as we call them, the, the modern technologies and um, very much into open source technologies, of course. Um, yeah, that's basically what we do. And uh, yeah, we briefly talked before sort of recording this, we talked a bit about containers and Kubernetes and DevOps and things like that. Um, and you also said modern technologies, right? So what I wish for you to tell me and, and our viewers is we hear the word DevOps and the word Kubernetes, right? And the word containers quite a lot here and many, many maybe legacy admins, let's call them that way. It's a bad way to call them, but you know, people that work with bare metal mostly, virtual machines, they feel very intimidated by this. And many people have been asking, is this microservice DevOps architecture thing, is this all a trend? Do I need it? Maybe I can stick with virtual machines. Why do I need these containers? Why do I need to learn another whole new set of technology? And then there's orchestration and it's, uh, it's complex. It's a whole new world. And uh, I know that you have an opinion on it and you've given it thought and maybe you can sort of talk, talk to me and explain to me and our viewers how you feel about it. And is it just a trend? Yeah. Um, uh, that, that, that's really a very big topic where we could uh, spend <laughs> many hours uh, talking about. I'm convinced that the entire DevOps way of thinking infrastructure is definitely something that is not going away. Um, containers and microservices are probably the next virtualization. So in IT infrastructures, long time ago now, virtualization really dramatically changed everything. And I'm convinced that containers are the next step that will happen. So there's no way to hide from that. Mm -hmm. um, so if you wish to stay relevant as an IT admin, you better learn those I containers. I do believe that very yeah. strongly. But it's not only the containers or the Kubernetes. It is more a philosophy or a paradigm on, on how to manage IT. And it actually makes a lot of things much easier and much more uh, capable of encapsulating functionalities into into technical entities, so to say. So the entire philosophy of having some repository where in a machine readable language, but also human readable language, you define what you want and the machine magically makes that happen for you. The whole infrastructure. Actually, yeah. that's the essence of all these things, DevOps, mm -hmm. Kubernetes as a platform to orchestrate the cloud uh, in terms of native services yeah. that you can just consume and you define those services, how you want them out of a, of a box, of an offering. Mm -hmm. um, yes, that's definitely something that's not going to go away. And it's even more, uh, I'm very sure that the classic data center as we know it, there will still be those 
big rooms with a lot of servers in yes. them. Um, but you can more see this as your private piece of cloud or your own island mm -hmm. where you can put your workloads on and it should be not important to where to put it. Mm -hmm. and, and as for those really large data centers, those will be hosted by cloud providers essentially and, and you'll be deploying your Probably, uh, probably they will, and um, also uh, Azure and AWS, etc. Yeah. They will, they will be there, um, but the on-prem will also not go away. That it's, that was my next question. Yeah. yeah, what's going to happen? Is everyone going to migrate eventually? Not everyone, right? It's a cost thing, and it's a it's a thing of of. Uh, the simple costs of how much do I pay for this server to put it in my rack uh, versus how much does operating this rack in that room, the cooling, the power, mm -hmm. the people I need to manage it, um, all this together makes a cost. And the cloud also makes a cost. And whether one cost or the other is, is higher or which benefits or disadvantages you have by one or the other, it's not even easy to calculate that upfront. Of course, yeah. We had a speech with some of the other partners where they said they have encountered issues where they did not calculate it upfront. And then it turns out that it was less beneficial, for example, that they initially had thought, or maybe the other way around on-prem was less efficient. We are seeing right now a big movement of, uh, of mostly mid-sized customers moving large parts of their infrastructure from the classic uh, data center out to, um, let's say, Azure. Mm -hmm. But they are not kind of rethinking everything and using the, the tools that there are. They're just box moving the same yeah. machines towards the cloud. And from my point of view, that does not bring any benefit. You're because not leveraging the exactly. tools. Exactly, you you're have. just doing the same work, but at another place and for that the cost is not going to be less because you still have the same processes behind you still mm -hmm. do like the same kind of management you still do everything the same then there, then there's no benefit you see and, and i think there's the hidden cost of you need to have a skilled admin to manage your cloud deployment right because okay i know how to maybe manage virtual machines i know how to manage my piece of software but I don't know anything about Azure or AWS or whatever. And there is a robust tool set that you can utilize, that you can automate. They have APIs, they have all kinds of things, right? Yes. And you have to learn those things if you wish, ideally. That's, that's definitely true, that. yes. And I think that's what people may be Or you need a trustworthy partner uh, yes, who of helps course. you doing these kinds of things. Yes. <laughs> and that's how your business, the business that you work at makes, makes yes. money. Yes. Um, all right, so, but speaking of, all right, Zabbix, um, I've also seen as a part of Zabbix company, we see the community input, we see what our customers do, and sometimes, yes, I do see people moving from either bare metal or virtual machine to, say, containers, or to, say, just cloud deployments. And sometimes it is like you say, like they just simply, you know, copy and paste it from virtual machines to the cloud, and, and that's it. And, yeah, not really seeing the goal there. And, and how do you think Zabbix by itself, is it fit? Is it a good choice for cloud deployments or container deployments? Or maybe there are some caveats or things like that? Well, there are is, there is several levels on, on which uh, that can be answered. Um, let's say in the first, the first level, let's, let's maybe focus on the deployment in containerized environments mm -hmm. first. Um, I would say that Zabbix is much more capable to, to be deployed in a cloud or a cloud native environment than, than even I would have expected, honestly. Um, and even more with the newer, uh, with the newer Zabbix versions, I, I, as far as I remember, it was around the five something that the, the web front end became really stateless yes. so that you yes. can five easily deploy a lot of um, web front ends and just transparently yeah. uh, load share between them. Now we have uh, a very nice functionality of the server HA, yes. which allows us also to just spawn many of them and uh, 
whichever of these is, is available, it will take over the job. If it dies, another one uh, will take over and orchestrators like Kubernetes can make sure this old broken one gets uh, wiped away and the new one will be joining, automatically joins the so cluster. So that's where Kubernetes can so come in over here, yeah. That is really uh, working very well. Um, so from, from that point of view, and yes, we are uh, already not yet preferring the um, not yet preferring the deployment on Kubernetes or um, such technologies like as the first the, the preferred way of doing it. Uh, it depends a lot on on the customer environment, but we already have several installations of Savix running in Kubernetes and running very well in Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. And we even have those as a offering to our customers where we are able to use central uh, continuous de deployment mechanisms to mm -hmm. automatically deploy Zabbix like on demand inside the infrastructure of the customer it's with, really just, nice. with yeah. just a push of a button, right? And, and that's really a huge benefit. And you get a fully redundant monitoring system with all bells and whistles in, yeah. in just nothing. Yeah? Just I guess thinking things once and yeah. making sure it will work this way because that's the way we designed it. I guess my takeaway from what you're saying is um, have a goal in mind. Why do you wish to migrate to containers? Not for the sake of migrating to containers and then not utilizing any orchestration technologies. Then what, what's the point? Or the cloud, the same goes for, for the mm. cloud. But like you said, if you are thinking, hey, with containers, we can achieve this and that and that and have, yeah, for example, Zabbix on demand, on demand Zabbix instance, right? That's a cool thing that, yeah, is a lot easier to achieve with containers and orchestration tools rather than virtual machines. You could do it yep. with virtual machines, but it's, it's bulky and heavy. And yes. Um, actually, <laughs> we have been working a lot with tools like Ansible in the past, and yeah. we still do, definitely. Um, we manage something between a few hundreds to a few thousand servers, virtual machines at different customers and our own uh, environments. and. Basically, the idea of an orchestration has, is the same. You have this central, uh, this single source of truth where everything is defined mm -hmm. and the infrastructure has to follow these rules. And everything in between is just a tool to do that. Mm -hmm. The big difference with the containers is that the containers do not have this transformation or transition from status A to status B, which in a server or virtual machine, you never know by a hundred percent which is status A. Yeah. So classical Ansible playbooks tend to bloat because you find out, oh, we have this specific uh, special situation at this customer. Yes. So we need to also uh, include this in our playbook. And, and so at the end, goes, you have yeah. the same problems or a little bit of the same problems that you originally had when you did the same thing with shell scripts. Yeah. And they bloat. In, in the container world, the, one of the biggest benefits is really that you always start from a defined status. And from there you take it. Mm -hmm. And if you need to do something different, you start from the same point and go a little, uh, a little other direction. Mm -hmm. and that's, that's a big, big benefit. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's maybe the one big benefit of, uh, of the containers. Um, yeah, um, we were at, We've How ready is Zabbix for, for, for the... How ready and when, you, when would you suggest it and when would you say, hey, maybe still stick with your virtual machines, it's, you're not ready maybe for containers? Are there, are there use cases like that? I would not build a Kubernetes uh, implementation at a customer just to run Zabbix on it. Uh -huh. yeah. Because Zabbix behaves the same good way on a server, mm -hmm. definitely. I would not make it so much dependent on the size of the infrastructure. 
Um, I have no negative uh, performance um, impacts of yeah. running Zabbix in containers. Of course, if you run it on very small machines, it's, it's probably the same not going to work. With VM, same right. problem yeah. as in the VMs. Um, but yeah, it, it depends a lot on, on, on what you have on, on what in you're your trying infrastructure. To achieve I mean, also, yeah. yeah. What's the point? Um, I guess you could also run a mix, right? Some components could be running on VMs, and for example, those front ends, front end instances that you said could be managed in containers, right? No problem. That could also absolutely. Work. Yeah. Um, we tend to do this a lot with the proxies. Yeah, so easy, to run quick the, to, the to run the Zabbix simple, proxies yeah. in containers is, is a, a no-brainer, mm -hmm. basically. And yeah. even more if you start like monitoring uh, public cloud environments and you have your services there and yes. still have your VMs there. And yeah. So that's very easy to, to just spawn a container and, yeah, and maybe make automate it automatically. some proxy deployment exactly. that way. Yeah. All right, so I think you gave us some great insights and our listeners and viewers will now greatly will think twice, first off, about why do sh they should go and how they can go about containers. Like they'll, they'll define, they'll now be able to define a use case. Okay, I can benefit this way, this way, this way, or I can benefit in no way at all. And I'm gonna, not going to do, like you said, a Kubernetes instance just for Zabbix because it works just as fine performance-wise on virtual machines and also gave us some great insights about uh, just where the technology is going and, and how you see it going and that it's not probably going away anytime soon. Oh no, it's not. All right, thank you a lot and hopefully, hopefully we'll see you at the Zabbix Summit in October. We will definitely. With a speech, definitely. That's, <laughs> that's the, the spirit that I was waiting for. And then maybe in between, if you have some good ideas or if you have something to say, we have our blog posts uh, available and you can always write a blog post with just your, your thoughts, a use case or anything else you wish to share with us. I think we'll all greatly benefit from it and read it. And yeah, uh, see you then in October with a great speech, probably about something similar that we discussed today. It maybe? could be. Could it be. could be. Okay, so <laughs> container enthusiasts, Kubernetes enthusiasts. Can't wait for the summit. All right, thank you. It was very valuable, and we'll see you around. Thank you very much. Bye.